Hello students of science, let's talk about respiration, how organisms take in oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide, one of the characteristics that makes up animals. All right, so here, human respiration system. Everybody breathes and every single one of our organs needs oxygen. It comes back to our basic cell respiration equation. That is to say, sugar and oxygen makes water, carbon dioxide, and energy in the form of ATP. We've previously talked about how important ATP is. Here we're going to focus on the importance of getting oxygen in to perform respiration and in getting carbon dioxide out, our waste product here. Every cell has to take in oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide in order to produce energy. You don't have enough oxygen, you're going to essentially not make ATP and die. Can't get rid of CO2, you're going to be poisoning your body, you're going to die. You have to take in oxygen, you have to get rid of carbon dioxide. And the organelle inside each of our cells that's essentially driving all this is of course the mitochondrion. That's the one that really needs the oxygen in and the carbon dioxide out. It supplies power to the rest of the cell, and if you shut down the power plant, you shut down the cell, you shut down enough cells, you shut down a person. So in order for the cells to live, they must constantly have oxygen supplied and carbon dioxide removed. The respiratory system's job, that is the one that is responsible for this all-important gas exchange. When we say gas exchange, we're talking on the organism level, oxygen has to go in and CO2 goes out. And this is what's happening inside your human lungs. Oxygen is going into the blood, carbon dioxide is leaving. So, respiratory structures have to provide a large surface area of moist, semi-permeable membrane. And the reason for that is it needs to be wet so that you can have the oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse through. And it has to do with surface area. We've seen this before when we were talking about mitosis, the importance of the surface area. Here we have this tube, 8 by 8 by 8 has a uh, you know, surface area of 384. This one, when it's broken up into many smaller structures, has its surface area drastically increased. By breaking it up into many, many, many smaller things, we increase the surface area. Your lungs have about 70 square meters of capillaries exposed to air. Remember, capillaries are those super, super, super tiny blood vessels. 70 square meters, that's about a third of the size of a tennis court. It's huge, that much of just the tiniest capillaries every breath you take. Unless, of course, you smoke, in which case that surface area is going to start decreasing. So respiratory structures have to maintain a really high oxygen slash carbon dioxide level, as necessary, on either side to promote diffusion. So let's take a look. This is inside the body. This, of course, is a blood vessel going through here. Let's say this is, you know, like, uh, you know, your foot here. The blood is being supplied full of oxygen, and as it goes through, it's going to kick off that oxygen. Those, you know, those two little red circles there are leaving. And what's going in? Carbon dioxide. And you can see how it's turning from bright red to slightly darker red. But of course, still red, damn it. But this is what's happening in the body. Oxygen is leaving the blood, carbon dioxide is entering. Of course, in the lungs, it's gonna be the exact opposite. The same blood vessel is gonna go through over to here, and carbon dioxide is going to leave the blood, and oxygen is going to enter. So here in your lungs, your body has to make sure there's lots of oxygen and little CO2 outside the blood to promote diffusion. And in the body, it's the exact opposite. There's not a lot of oxygen in the cells, but there is a lot here, so it promotes the oxygen to leave, and there's a lot of CO2 out here and not a lot in the blood, so it promotes the CO2 to enter. So it maintains opposite concentrations, depending if I'm taking the oxygen out of the blood or putting the oxygen into the blood. Here you can see kind of a rough diagram of the lungs and every breath you take, it's kind of phenomenal how much your lungs expand and every single one of these lines is a little artery or vein or a capillary. I mean, capillaries are going to be even more so than this, but it's drastically increasing the surface area so that oxygen and CO2 can diffuse across. Here, I'm um, sorry for this, but that's a cat one being inflated, and you can see the drastic difference in size. They're not like this big open bag that just opens and closes. They're tiny, 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 thousands if not millions of tiny little bags that inflate or deflate. Here you can see the exact opposite. Big difference in your ones between fully inflated and not fully inflated. And remember, in human ones, 70 square meters of surface area, a third of the size of a tennis court, every breath. Now, aquatic invertebrates and invertebrates, except reptiles and mammals, so we're talking you know, a lot of fish and a lot of other crustaceans, exchange gases through gills. Gills are very feathery structures, very fine, very thin, that expose a large amount of semi-permeable surface area to water. And they're red because blood is going through there. Just like blood is going through your lungs, blood is going through fish gills. 
Inside those gills are many thin-walled blood vessels, those little capillaries. That's where gas exchange is going to take place. Now here's the funky thing. Fish will suffocate out of water because the water keeps those tiny gill feathers separate. So if you've, ever, you've probably seen you know, someone with long hair underwater, that hair is just going to finally separate. But the moment they go above water, it's just going to kind of clump together. And that's going to essentially suffocate the fish. They need those blood vessels very far apart so the water can get through. When you go out of water, they're going to stick together and the fin essentially the fish is suffocating. That's why you can't pull a fish out of the water and you know, expect it to do just fine. Here you can see underwater, hair separates freely. But of course, if you pull it above water, it's gonna kinda of stick together. Fine structures like hair and gills clump together out of water due to the surface tension. You know, underwater, you can see the hair is all separate from each other, but the moment you get above there, the water just wants to stick to itself, so it clumps together. If you're a fish, your gills are clumping together and you're suffocating. Now, if you're on land, an invertebrate here, they have a lot of different respiratory structures to work with. They can breathe through their skin, mantle cavities, just kind of opening inside their bodies, book lungs, and tracheal tubes. Here's a terrible animation, but you can see earthworms here. As long as the skin stays wet, they can diffuse air, oxygen in, and carbon dioxide out. Of course, when they dry out, they're going to die of suffocation. Here is uh, tracheal tubes. It's essentially like snorkels embedded throughout their body that pulls the oxygen in, and of course they use it to push the CO2 out. And they have these all throughout their body. And this is why something like a slug, you know, terrestrial invertebrate, this is why using salt on them is kind of cruel. It dries them up, and this means they can't get oxygen in, and they can't get carbon dioxide out, so they're going to suffocate more or less. Speaking of, you know, invertebrate respiration, if an ant were the size of a human, you know, everyone's talked about, oh, how big it would be, would not be able to bring in enough oxygen to survive. Yeah, they might be able to lift up stuff, but they are limited in size due to oxygen. If the oxygen in the air was bigger, insects would be bigger. So, you know, let's be thankful we don't have lots of oxygen in the air. Also, everything would set fire. Here you can see, you know, salt. But anyways, the whole idea is salt causes the water to leave, and when they dehydrate, they suffocate. So, you know, don't do salt, kids, or drugs, you know or salty drugs, any kind of salty. All right, terrestrial vertebrate. That, of course, is us. All terrestrial vertebrates, stuff with the backbone, use lungs. Lungs are organs where gas exchange, of course, O2 in, CO2 out, occurs between the air and the blood. So this is where our air and the blood actually meet. Typically, they're not going to meet anywhere else in your body unless something bad has happened. And, of course, we have this little muscle down there called the diaphragm. More on that later. But you can see how as it expands and contracts, it causes those lungs to open and close. By the way, there's a reason there's that big hole there. That's the heart. And the, your left lung is a little bit smaller due to the left ventricle of your heart. Lungs are filled with these bubble-like structures called alveoli. They almost look like, you know, a bunch of little grapes almost on the end of these little tubes here, and those little tiny things across the outside, those are the capillaries. That's where the air and the blood are actually going to meet. Deoxygenated blood will enter, pick up oxygen, and leave with its oxygen. In human lungs, air is going to move in and out through the same passageway, which means that the bottom of your lungs, you know, that one, it's going to be, be kind of stale air. It never gets fully exhaled, and, you know, it's kind of been down there not as, not as well. So our, you know, one way in, one way out, is not quite as efficient compared to other organisms. Here you can see another uh, animation of the alveoli, these little bubbles that expand and contract and of course covered with capillaries. Here you can kind of see a zoom in on it and you can see the blood is going through there and as it expands and contracts, this allows the oxygen to diffuse into the blood and the CO2 out. So here's zooming in on one of the alveoli or an alveolus. Oxygen is going in, carbon dioxide is going out, and this is happening trillions of times every second in all the different alveoli of your lungs. Very, very important. Birds, however, have it even better than we do. They have more efficient one-way lungs. It's kind of hard to follow. It's a little confusing, but more or less the idea is oxygen is always passing through in a single direction. They never have any of that stale air just kind of get stuck inside there. We don't have that, you know, so we kind of have that stale air in the bottom of our lungs. Birds, which of course spend a lot of time flying and have huge oxygen needs, have evolved a much better system for oxygen efficiency. So they never get that stale air trapped in the system. I found this really cool uh, animated 
section called three different ways to breathe and I'll have the link down in the description but here we can see human ones and once again you can see deoxygenated blood the yellow is going in and deoxygenated blood the pink is kind of going out you can see as our diaphragm expands and contracts it pulls oxygen in so deoxygenated blood flows over oxygen is going to you know enter from the lungs and go in there so that we have oxygenated blood leaving and deoxygenated blood entering Birds, as I mentioned, have that more efficient one-way system, and you need to kind of stare at this thing for hours trying to figure out how it works, but you can see more or less they're bringing in oxygenated air, that's going to be kind of the yellow, and it's going to pass over these capillaries here, and it's going to be a lot more efficient because you never get stale air stuck in there. You know, those are squeezing, they're going to pushing it over, so oxygen is going to enter the blood, and deoxygenated uh, stuff is going to leave as it's going to exhale. So there we have bird ones. Then, of course, we have something like grasshopper trachea. And this one's kind of crazy, too. You can see it's pulling in oxygen from these spiracles right here as these air sacs expand and contract. And then carbon dioxide is going to leave through different uh, spiracles, different tracheal tubes out there. So, different ways to breathe, but they all accomplish the exact same thing. Oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. Whether it's humans, birds, or insects, they all accomplish the same thing. And here's kind of just uh, the last picture I want to leave you with. This should definitely go in the summary of your notes. Let's just focus on this little pink circle here. That is a red blood cell. So let's start from the beginning. Red blood cell is going to come in through the deoxygenated capillary, and it's going to go, it's going to pick up oxygen, and it's going to return to the rest of the body. We can see oxygen is coming in where it's going to meet up with the red blood cell, and the CO2 is almost getting dropped off at the airport, more or less and it's going to exhale through there. So deoxygenated blood comes in, drops it off, and is going to pick up a new oxygen molecule and take it out through the body. That's the general idea.